Hi, I'm Dan Robinson with the Great Lakes Spirituality Project, and I am very happy and honored to be talking with Dr. Patty Lowe. She is a member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe and is a professor at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University and also is the director of Northwestern's Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, for uh, talking with me today. Miigwech. And uh, would you like to say a little bit and introduce yourself? Sure, thank you very much. Um, Ani Niji, um, Patti Lo, Waswa Kanokwe, Indijinakaz, Mashkazibi, and Dojaba, Mungo Dem. So I just introduced myself as Patti Lo. My um, Ojibwe name is Torchlight. I'm a water woman. Um, I am uh, a citizen of, of Mashkazibi, which translates to um, Medicine River. That's what we call the bad river. We don't think it's bad at all. Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe, and I'm a member of the Loon Clan. Okay, well, thank you. So, um, could you could you say a little bit about um, your tribe's uh, connection to and relationship with Lake Superior? It's kind of asking the obvious uh, because mm -hmm. you're right there on the shore. But could you talk a little bit about that? Lake Superior Gitchigami, as we call it, um, is really the source of our sustenance, both spiritually and, um, and in a physical sense. Our reservation is on the south shore of Lake Superior, and we've always looked to the lake for the food we eat, the ceremonies we do. Um, it, uh, our particular reservation has 75 acres of wild rice, and if you know anything about wild rice, it's um, an indicator species. It cleans the water. We, 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 we've called them the lungs of Lake Superior. Mm. Um, they really allow the water, the larger lake to breathe. Um, it filters the water. It's a nursery for fish, for small mammals, for birds. Um, our people have been eating the rice forever. It's at the heart of our identity. It's the reason why we're where we are. Um, you know, back who knows how long ago, at the beginning of time, there was a, a flood that covered the earth. And um, when it, uh, we, it caused us to move from the places that we are now to the East Coast. And we were there for a very, very long time. And there were prophecies that we needed to return to our homelands because um, there was a crisis happening. And unless we left and returned and went back to the place where the food grows on water, um, we would be destroyed. So the people packed up and the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa moved together um, following along what we call today the St. Lawrence River um, from the East Coast. Uh, the um, Gulf of St. Lawrence, um, back to the um, Western Great Lakes region in search of this food that grows on water. And of course, when we got back to the Lake Superior region, we found rice growing on the water. That was the fulfillment of our prophecy. And if you look at the events of our past, everything connects to wild rice. The, the wars that we fought, the treaties we signed, um, the documents we negotiated, um, the ceremonies we do, the powwow we hold, everything in our being revolves around rice. And so, um, yeah, uh, I, I know I kind of went on probably too long, but no, no, the long. Superior no. and the um, the wild rice beds that support it is who we are as Ojibwe people. Oh. Well, you mentioned for you specifically that, and I, I hope I got this right, that you are a water woman. Could you, could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, Torchlight on the Water Woman. Um, I received that name um, 40, 50 years ago from an Anishinaabe elder by the name of Nelson Shepo, who lived at Lac de Flambeau. And um, it sort of loosely relates to the torches that were used in spearing fish. Mm. And so, um, 
it's not just lights on the water, it's lights on the water that are used to spear fish during the springtime. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's a little bit more descriptive than what the, uh, the name, there's a lot to the name that isn't evident in the actual translation. Sure, sure. Um, now you talked a little bit about how um, Lake Superior, uh, Gichigami, as you, in your language, um, affects who you are as a people and, and your in your spirituality. And one thing I've run into with in conversations like this with other indigenous leaders is that the, the, the English language sort of separates out spirituality from just who we are as people. And so that's a limitation that I acknowledge as we kind of talk about this, but mm -hmm. so the question itself is kind of limited. But what I want to ask is in what way, I mean, can you describe how that location of your people affects your spirituality and, and might make it look different than say someone like myself with a european background who it didn't my people didn't originate from there yeah you know it's it is really difficult to explain because i think most um of the major religions and i i'm talking about christianity judaism um islam really are more liturgical. There are events and the calendar is, um, is it, it's really organized around the birth of Jesus or the Ascension or the Assumption or um, Christmas. Um, so no matter where you are in the world, you can pick up your holy objects. You know, you can put a prayer rug over your shoulder you can put a rosary in your pocket, you can wear a Star of David around your neck, and you can travel the planet, and you can um, s connect with your religion, say your prayers, or whatever your spiritual routine is, you can practice your spirituality anywhere on the planet. And, and most oftentimes, you can find people of like mind who will, um, who, who will practice with you. Native religions are very different. They're nature-based. And so, um, you know, when we talk about the lake as being a spiritual being or rocks as being spiritual being, you know, Native, Native communities have at their center this sacred place. Um, and every community that I've visited, really, the traditional people have this, you know, whether it's it's Oneida and their standing stone back in in um, in New York, the present day New York, or the Ho Chunk with their um, place of origin and Mo Mogashoot, uh, Red Banks near Green Bay, um, or the Menominee, you know, with their origin stories in the Menominee River. There are these places that are sacred, and everything worth remembering emanates from that place. And so when, when people um, practice their spirituality, it's connected to that place. They're not praying for good fortune or good health or um, you know, redemption. It's their, you know, native religions are basically, have, you know, they're at, the adherents of these nature-based religions are, are praying for that place, for the health of that place, which means, you can't be you can't be anywhere else and practice your religion. Your religion is place based, and so when um, you know we have these struggles between corporate rights and sacred sites, there isn't that understanding that you know a, a place itself is sacred because you know legislators and developers don't see stained glass they don't see spires they don't see all the things that we associate with you know the big three religions and you know in in the case of my reservation um when the legislative wisconsin legislature was um debating the mining bill you know one of the legislators came up and looked over and was what's the big deal i mean it's nothing but a bunch of weeds he didn't see the sacredness of our wild rice he just saw weeds and that's a really difficult thing to get across. Yeah, and, and it's one of the limitations that I find, and I mentioned this just a bit ago, is language. That we don't have necessarily an English 
the way to sort of describe the sacredness of a place versus like as you said ritual because so much so many of those rituals are language based rituals right um and i and this isn't it seems like a small thing but it just sort of cut me as i was looking over your your um curriculum vitae uh you, it said you you studied language for japanese language for two years <laughs> at portland state and i saw that and i thought oh my goodness wow she speaks at least three languages that's amazing so <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <understand> <laughs> <the> <laughs> 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 I just said my Japanese is lousy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a far side better than mine because I didn't know that's what you said. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I'm just wondering, as you you being such a strong communicator, and, we, and I, I could run, to, I, we could spend the rest of our time just talking about the things that you've done, producing documentaries for public and commercial television, all the books and and articles you've written and such. What place do you think language has in terms of being able to communicate that worldview that you that you um, that you talk about in terms of being mm. tied to a place? Do you see that wow, as being? Essential? I'm not even sure how to answer that. I know for me, it comes. I think from my clan obligations. You know, I'm a member of the Loon Clan. The Loons were diplomats and communicators. We were the runners carried messages from community to community back in the old days. And so, of course, I'm going to go into journalism, you know, <laughs> communication. <laughs> Literally, I was born to do this. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, I think, you know, I think traveling and exper experiential learning is really important. You know, that's what I feel like I've been so blessed to have experienced in my life is um, spending really quality time in native communities, primarily in the, in the Western Great Lakes region, but also in the Pacific Northwest and the American Southwest. Um, when you talk to people and really listen, I think that's when you begin to understand their worldview. And you know, my classes, um, I, I teach Native American environmental issues in the media. And I start with origin stories. I start with creation stories. Because I think if you, you hear some, the, the, uh, I think creation stories gives us, give us insight into the values and beliefs of a, of a community. So you can look at a story like um, the Oneida story um, and I, I, I say this, I've, I've had permission to share this story. You know, some of these stories should only be told at a certain time of the year. And, um, but this is a story that's been published and it's the, the uh, sky woman falling from the earth story. And there's some things that go on in the sky world and, and um, it, you know, to, to condense this, there's a, um, the tree of, of, of life is, pulled out, is it's uprooted, leaving this gaping hole in the sky world. And um, and sky world either a sky woman either accidentally falls or is pushed by a jealous, jealous husband. There's different versions of the story. But as she's falling through this hole, she grabs at a branch to try to stop herself and grabs all the seeds of life. She falls through this hole. Um, the animals below, um, she's falling into this watery abyss, and the animals are looking at this tumbling figure, thinking, boy, she's not going to do very well here. She doesn't have webbed feet. She doesn't have wings. So birds stop her fall and gently lower her onto the back of turtle, um, and then earth divers dive down bring up some muck, which she spreads on turtle's back, and she plants the seeds that she's grabbed on her way down through this hole and plants them, and the, the world begins again. So you look at a story like that, and animals are co-creators of the universe. They're not objects that someone is, is told to name or to have dominion over, if you look at other creation stories. So you understand you look at that and you and you begin to think okay this is a community that has a different view of the of the role of animals and that's going to come out in the
the way you know people live their lives. Uh, the Hopi creation story begins underground, um, and there's this emergence. Um, and even today, the Hopi have kivas next to their their house, these underground sacred spaces, and their ceremonies begin in these kivas, and then um, in some cases they'll they'll uh, come up to the surface and and do ceremonial dancing um, publicly, but the, a lot of their spirituality, their rituals happen underground. If you understand that, if you know that story, you can predict that the Hopi are going to have a, a difficult time with coal mining or uranium mining. You know, so these, you know, when I when we talk about place, this is how place connects to that spirituality. It's it's not separated the way it is in mainstream American culture. Um, spirituality is just woven into all aspects. It's not something that you can extricate. Sure, sure. Well, you mentioned the difference with mainstream culture. And I'm gonna go back to something you said earlier about um, you being a part of the Loon Clan, if I understood you correctly, that's the diplomats, the communicators. <laughs> but you're, you're being a diplomat with someone else and you're be communicating with someone else. And, it strikes me with all the work that you've done, you're communicating with the wider society here in the US and in North America and beyond. What is it you think, as you look at sort of the situation now, what do you think that the wider society needs to hear from the Ojibwe people or, or indigenous peoples that we're not getting right now that we need at this moment? I think if there's one thing I can point to, it's seventh generation thinking. You know, um, the Ojibwe are not the only people, indigenous people who have this philosophy of seventh generation. Um, the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquoian speaking people, the Haudenosaunee, Oneida, Cayuga, Onondaga, et cetera, they also have something they call seventh generation thinking it's, it operates a little bit differently. But, um, and I'm always um, a little cautious about painting 574 federally recognized sovereign nations with the same brush because we, there is so much diversity out there. But in my experience, if there is a universal theme, it's the concept of land stewardship. You know, the, the Native people who have been fortunate enough to remain on their ancestral lands have this really deep connection. It's, it's almost like a like a dance you know if we if you are connected to land for such a long time you sort of adapt yourself to the rhythms of the cycle the seasonal cycle the um you plant at a certain time you celebrate at a certain time and um and if you're able to adapt yourself to the rhythms of this landscape that's fine it's kind of a when in Rome, do as the Romans do. It's only when you know you're doing the polka and everybody else is doing a waltz that, you know. I, and I think about that in in terms of of colonialism, you know, colonizing. Um, they didn't adapt. This the you know European settlers didn't adapt to the rhythms of this landscape. They superimposed their own rhythms onto it, and I think that's led us to where we are today. So seventh generation tells us that in this generation, we have an obligation to act in a certain way and to make decisions um, for the benefit of those that will come back, will, will be on this earth seven generations into the future. So we're thinking about, you know, 200 years, what's best for my great grandchildren, um, your great, great, great grandchildren. Um, and it obligates you to this sort of, selflessness and this generosity and wisdom and farsightedness and it also makes makes you think inevitably about the sacrifices that generations seven in the past made for you you know i think about my great 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 ancestor who is one of the signers of the session treaties that um you know transferred ojibwe land to the federal government he didn't have much of a choice um, because those treaties were a very coercive, they involved a coercive process. But, you know, the fact that 
the Ojibwe reserved the right to hunt fish and gather rice upon the waters for my generation is it, it it's humbling and so that kind of thinking carries forward and you know now with um floods and fires and you know all these environmental threats that we're seeing now associated with climate change and and other you know really dramatic changes in the landscape um we need that kind of thinking more than ever and you know i think i think there's probably no greater gift than that native people can give mainstream society um, than this environmental ethic that in ojibwe culture is manifested as seventh generation thinking yeah. well and, and you just you if i understand this correctly your most recent book was seventh generation earth ethics it's telling the story of 12 indigenous leaders from Wisconsin and their impact on sustainability. Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and so is there, do you what see a project? Oh, no, no, go, no ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead. That's all right. I was just going to say that, you know, that came out of my, my first book, which was Indian Nations of Wisconsin. It was um, trying to tell history without relying on the printed word. Mm. Gathering history, oral history, um, looking at pictographs and petroglyphs and and basket weavings and mnemonic devices and cave paintings and trying to reconstruct the past um, in a way that really privileged the oral tradition. So I was really reliant on individuals in each of the 12 communities and they were so fascinating and so inspiring. I just, you know, I kept thinking, oh, somebody should write a book about Walt Brissett. Oh man, Sparky Waka, what a great guy. Somebody really, you know, needs to write a a, you know, a book about this amazing Menominee guy. And um, so I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I tried my best. Uh, and, and now, you know, there's a whole new generation of young environmental activists out there in Indian country. And I, I think it's time for somebody, not me, um, but somebody in the ne that next generation to pick up the torch and uh, write about some of the amazing advocacy that's going on in Indian country right now. Well, I know you do a lot of outreach work doing digital storytelling with young folks, young, young indigenous uh, people. Um, do you, so do you see them picking that torch up, it sounds like, and kind of moving forward with it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there was a documentary a couple of years ago that I was lucky enough to mentor with three 14 year olds called Protect Our Future. You can Google that and find it online and, and um, download it or stream it. Um, and uh, they put together this uh, documentary that looked at an, um, a threat, a potential threat from an open pit taconite mine proposal. And that documentary won three national awards. It screened wow. at you know 35 environmental conferences and film festivals. And um, you know, it was really inspiring to see these young people who really felt the need to protect their rice and to, um, just, you know, uh, use their voice for, for change. Um, and they're not alone. There, there's a lot of young people out there. And so at times, I think it's just time for my generation to shut up and <laughs> hide and let them, you know, get on with it. <laughs> oh. Well, I, that's a good, a, a moment of hope is a good place to wrap this up. So I can't, yeah. um, I can't thank you enough for talking with me today. It's been an honor having a conversation with you, Dr. Lowe. And thank you for all the work that you've done. And, um, and I wish you well in the semester coming forward. I know it's an unusual time for everybody, but especially folks at university. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Most welcome. Thank you.